thanks for being here early morning. Um, so uh, I'm uh, very excited to kick off the conference today. We had a great set of speakers yesterday, the keynote speakers at uh, second grade stage. They shared a powerful message with us uh, that was around the theme of this gathering and this conference, uh, bringing two very distinct fields with uh, different criteria together. So as these experts that have excelled in their field presented, um, uh, he taught me something that I think is very important for this conference, and that is the courage to speak to the other field with the different criteria. So I'm going to write on that courage today and share with you my work. I know you guys are experts in, in your field. So the topic of uh, psychology of architecture in healthcare is a very important one, it's a no-brainer, because, and almost clients speak it, but if you don't apply the uh, focus of psychology and architecture, they, they may be discouraged of finding you if you're, uh, if you're going for a project. And the reason is clear, because in a life cycle cost, um, in a business of healthcare, the costliest share is actually staff cost. So here you see different statistics that are put together from different states or different uh, or a book that all consisted 40 to 50 percent chunk of life cycle cost uh, for a healthcare business goes to funding staff and therefore their performance and uh, uh, their productivity and their health becomes very uh, very key. So in, a, in an organization, when we focus on the business of healthcare and the organizational outcomes, obviously from the field of organizational psychology, we know that how people, how employees feel, how they behave, and um, how they think affects the outcomes. So um, uh, what Elizabeth uh, told us yesterday uh, in her keynote speech um, about affective, cognitive, and behavioral components um, of a work environment, what we call work attitudes, and from evidence, you know, work attitudes affect performance and productivity. So this is the framework of the talk today, how the psychology architecture affects organizational outcomes. So um, I teach a class on workplace design, and uh, my students and I play a little matching puzzle uh, together that I thought I shared that with you, which lies on the same components, how design and architecture can help achieve the organizational outcome, but how can we match that? So this is the game we play. Let's say we focus on analyzing the environment in healthcare and the goal that that organization needs to provide, the challenges and the conditions in which employees work, and what are the goals of that setting. So, for example, let's look at a work environment, a work process that's monotonous, but it has higher stakes for errors. So if they make errors, they may kill somebody, and that still happens in healthcare. Healthcare uh, kills, unfortunately, 50 to 90,000 people a year just by a mistake. Um, so from a psychological perspective, when you have monotonous task, you need to restore cognition. And so therefore, you need sensory and cognitive stimulation to help with that condition to be restored in a monotonous, uh, kind of flat uh, process environment. So from the field of uh, social and organizational psychology, we know there's actually an environmental response to that. And that uh, uh, established literature reviews tell us audio, visual, and kinesthetic stimulations uh, where environment can play a significant role can actually respond to to create those sensory experiences. Therefore, uh, in, uh, restore cognitive uh, performance in a monotonous environment. What we call when it's a monotonous uh, environment where people kind of put it on cruise control, we kind of call it a skill-based task. Now let's focus on another activity that happens in the healthcare setting. Um, compliance with certain um, uh, Protocol. So behavioral compliance, you must follow the rules. That was what we call a rule-based task. Um, for this one, I want to refer to the talk that Alexi had yesterday in the keynote talk. And she referred to the science of behavioral economics. And she talked to us about nudge. Um, so I like so in addition to nudge, there's there are other tools in behavioral economics, such as default or choice architecture. Uh, the science of behavioral economics tells us people usually tend to follow the thoughts. Therefore, if you want to uh, encourage people to uh, conduct uh, positive behavior, just set the defaults right, design the defaults right. 
Therefore, there is an environmental response to that. Uh, layout and spaces and interiors and services, how we manage that, we are also encouraging workers to, um, to follow those, com to comply and follow those protocols appropriately. And this is already being applied like in laboratories and in lean processes in laboratories. They set the uh, processes so that it actually uh, matches with the workflow. Therefore, errors happen less and productivity increases. Um, let's look at another activity. We call it a knowledge based uh, task. Activity that requires advanced le reasoning, a lot of critical thinking, problem solving. Let's say um, surgeons uh, open a patient up and they discover something they didn't know, and they need to concentrate and they need to think about it, and they need to engage with response. For that, a psychological response is concentration. And from evidence um, in uh, um, environmental psychology and in psychology, we know. There is actually a behavioral response, environmental response for that too, right? So with environment, we can actually control interruptions. We can control visual interruptions, audio interruptions, and in-person interruptions. So that is called privacy, visual, uh, physical, and uh, um, access privacy. Last I know I want to mention as an example of this matching puzzle is, let's say, a work environment that has a high emotional and physical stress. Psychologists in the room, what's the response to an environment, a work environment with high emotional and physical stress? And now that uh, nurse or that physician needs to be also able to quickly switch to a creative problem solving. Therefore, you would want me as a designer to create an environment that controls that stress, that controls that cortisol peak, and emotional cognitive restoration is occurred. So that lies on Kaplan and Kaplan's theory very well, where it talks about macro-responsive experiences in the environment. Where we uh, have a sip of coffee, smell the coffee, look outside the window, uh, look at a nice view or design, and suddenly we feel restored. That micro moment of something beautiful that actually restores the cognitive function. And there is a lot of literature around the effect of nature, like um, Kaplan and Kaplan described, soothing colors and ergonomics. That is a response, again, to reduction of stress. So we talked about different forms of work. I just wanted to kind of summarize them. We talked about knowledge-based tasks, let's say a task that requires a lot of concentration, problem solving. Uh, let's say a, a new patient symptom arises, and uh, the nurse or a doctor needs to immediately think critically, consult the literature, talk to other people. The rule-based task, which we set, we follow a set of rules, let's say a nurse needs to change IV, so they need to follow protocols. They, it doesn't, they shouldn't be creative about it. They have to look at the date, check the patient's name with the wristband uh, name, change the IV, make sure it's correct, sign, and put the new date on it. Just follow the protocol, right? Or there may be a very skill-based task, like putting, filling in the medication and pills in boxes. So, as you guys notice, for each of these are different behavioral responses required. Another note is that each job, not one job is really focusing on one of these buckets. Each job is a combination, right? So for example, okay. myself, when I go to work, if I want to do some sort of a knowledge-based task, I make sure I close my door, set a nice music, grab the best cup of coffee I have, and then I focus on writing. And if that environment is impossible, I'm not going to do the knowledge based act. I'm actually going to check my emails, do something that's more of a less cognitive role, rule based and skill based. So, within that criteria that I talked to you about, um, I'm going to share with you uh, two or three case studies, uh, examples of the, some of the folks that I've been doing, to see how we are really studying the effect of architecture. And how can we leverage the research and the science that psychologists and behavioral psychologists are sharing with us to enhance the environment in the organization? So this is an exploratory ethnographic study, which means um, on the top of the 
which means we are not testing the hypothesis. You know, we are general, trying to generate hypotheses by seeking knowledge from the workers, from the audience, and from the participants. And hopefully, the psychologists can take these and test hypotheses in laboratory fields. So in this case, uh, we asked 207 healthcare employees, what should I do in workplace? Where do you work? How, what do you need to be productive and healthy and uh, contribute to the organization? So everybody in this uh, organization, it was four facilities and places, they responded. And they were from like all levels, lab tech, pharmacist, counselor, physician, nurse, administrator, and business personnel. Everybody responded. So we gave them a set of uh, a list of uh, variables we found from a literature review that literature and science uh, says these correlate with or affect uh, performance and productivity. And we also told them, okay, if literature didn't say what you want to say, please tell us. So what we did was we did a uh, content analysis, which is a really nice qualitative method to objectively analyze themes and texts. So it actually calculates the number of things and just piles them up. So we can uh, more objectively say what's most important. So basically the 207, if you summarize and say what are the criteria, design criteria for productive workplace, they collectively 207 they said these things are important. However, the very interesting things comes when we divided the analysis by the job title. The difference between the nurse, the applicant, and the business. And we thought this was a really interesting discovery. Now I pulled up one example, and this is being um, this is in review, so it will be published hopefully. Um, I pulled up one example and look at the component of privacy. Uh, in other words, if design combines the visual, audio, and access barriers. And look, for the monitor tech and the psychologist, you know, these are completely different. The psychologist and the nurses, these are almost their first choices. Privacy comes at the most important, and for the monitor tech, it was the least important. Actually, we went back and talked to them. And so, guess what? These monitor techs in the, in the facility that we did the study, what they do is they have a rule-based task. They have to watch these monitors all day for like eight hours. As the light goes off and the blinking comes on, they need to call the nurse and just page that specific nurse. And they do this all day. Uh, however, obviously, the psychologist or the physician or nurse might have a different process that's not based on. This, well, therefore, I thought this was a great example to show matching and understanding the nature of the work and matching um, the, the physical environment to the nature of the work, the way that the science of psychology directs us to. Now, these monitors were very unhappy in that environment because they were given a, a confined space and they, they, they claimed they would be very sleepy and tired in that space. So that brings me to our second case study. This is also an ethnographic study. This, way, this time we went to 168 healthcare workers, and we told them this. We asked them this. We said, what makes, helps you keep your alertness and help with your arousal? And when you get sleepy and tired, which happens a lot in healthcare, you could restore your cognitive performance. What are the behavioral coping mechanisms you use? What are the environmental uh, stimulations around you that help you keep your alertness? The graph I show you guys is a work in progress in the qualitative analysis. Uh, and this one is also in the uh, for publication. Um, so I'll show you different iterations of the results, but not the results itself. But I think there's so much message here. Um, so in the qualitative analysis, different groups need to review the data to make sure we are not uh, subjective about it, we are objective about it. So I have actually two iterations of the data after two reviews. What is really interesting here is that, look, the organization and environment we designed for displayed people resulted the kind of work that the environment they work in, they, they are, 60% of these people are self medicating with caffeine to stay alert in the workplace. Some of them opt for healthier options, like soft drinks, uh, cold drinks, on, um, unsweetened beverages, etc. Um, then we, we were trying to find out how to cluster these behavioral <coughs> coping mechanisms. And we tried different things. And so you see, like, this is a different iteration. One thing we learned uh, overall, uh, without um, 
uh, going in too much details of the result, is that we found that when it comes to coping mechanisms, people have dietary strategies, but also they have cognitive, social, or kinesthetic strategies. They are looking for those, these types of stimulations in the environment, in the environment and in the workplace. It would be a really good question how a facility and an environment can provide you the stimulation. As you guys know, many different uh, um, organizations uh, are already at the uh, For example, aviation students, British Airlines, where our guest speaker talked about this today, uh, NASA, uh, military, um, yeah, some of the uh, corporate, like Google, Hotspot, are actually uh, creating these uh, social, cognitive, stimulating uh, physical environments and uh, uh, organizational environments for their employees. So, as I mentioned, this was also an ethnographic study. We asked the participants and employees to inform us the way forward. It would be great if this would be followed by more interventional studies. What we could do. Um, with the given knowledge and resources we had was um, do a cross-sectional study, which helped us test one variable. And the effect of that one variable around the design and architecture on uh, people's performance. So we were fortunate to find this uh, excellent setting. Uh, this is a nurse's station um, in a hospital that uh, the same nurses work in two different wards. These two wards are in the same organization with the same director. They care for the same type of patient with the same type of action. Perfect. So what we did was that we followed 14 nurses in two teams. And the reason we selected this was that within the ethnographic study data we collected, both from the behavioral standpoint and the environmental standpoint, uh, that I didn't show you the environmental standpoint, but the number one item that came up by our participants was daylight. And writing is the number one thing I want in my environment and feel a lot. And so many also many people talk about going outdoors, getting fresh life. Um, so we said, okay, let's test this one item. It uh, looks like this might be a significant item. For eight hours at each location, total 16 hours, we followed 14 nurses. We collected biological and behavioral data. We wanted to know, does really uh, writing in the quality of daylight will improve behavior in the sense that would it really have a restorative effect? Would it really have an alerting effect? How the literature describes and how our participants claim, but we don't know if that would be true. So biological and behavioral data is clear. We collected tons of uh, variables. I don't want to talk about everything because of the time, but I, uh, we, talk, we collected work-related um, uh, outcomes such as communication, uh, etc. And we also Collected non work related outcomes. Um, one example I'm showing, and also we collected blood pressure, heart rate, etc. So this uh, shows, you, shows you guys the non work related, which is called subsidiary behavior. Subsidiary behavior are not directly related to work, but they're actually constructive behaviors because evidence shows that they occur. So subsidiary behavior like yawning, yawning at the workplace is actually constructive. Why? Because as we have a cognitive decline, this subsidiary behavior happens. And research indicates that after that, we have a slight restoration of cognition. So we, co we collected using a PDA and a program we had on PDA with two observers and we did interrelated reliability between our observation. And every time a third person yawned, we just collected it. And it was very interesting to see uh, when people, um, the same people, <coughs> working in two different environments, almost every subsidiary behavior was less than the by Can the environment offset some of that awareness aspect so that people, now I'm just kind of making my hypothesis, people would consume less caffeine, people would uh, conduct less non-regulated behavior. We also found uh, heart rate was lower. Um, obviously, you know, speaking to the psychologists and scientists, I know this one study reported subject is not sufficient. But that could possibly ex be explained by the uh, um, nature and restoration theory. So I talked to you guys about um, a topic of safety and productivity. The last item I want to talk about is the role of environment and architecture on compliance, on behavioral compliance and um, uh, adherence to the rules, which means it's really important. You know? uh, 
again, it can be life and death situation. So I have two examples to share with you guys uh, very briefly. The first one is a work done by Jeff Mino, um, a, a graduate student at Tiffany University I've had the chance to be advisor to. And he has a study, the influence of uh, uh, basically spatial characteristics of design on the possibility of uh, nurses following a hand washing compliance right before they get in contact with the patient, which is extremely critical. And um, so he, um, he, his findings are very interesting that they were it's in his thesis, but the, the analysis and the comparison is very, very interesting. How environment might be actually a predictor of behavior in such an important uh, task. The second study is a work that uh, uh, my students collaborated with Clark Schwartz Architects in Oregon. And what we did was that we looked at whether or not, again, using space syntax methods that measure spatial characteristics of a physical environment, does the design of a spatial layout uh, influence nurses following the rules at the point of medication dispensing? That's really, really important location. People can uh, commit errors, and they have to follow protocols, and they have to concentrate. Right? So here you see my students are analyzing the characteristics of the space, such as access, like food access, and visibility, and control of that location that's measured using mathematical models. So, um, um, and our uh, partnering architect uh, collected some surveys about these uh, locations, and we did a correlational study. And what we found is that there was a relationship between how nurses perceive their easy, it's easy this location to follow the protocol and to do um, safe dispensing of medication with the characteristics of the physical environment. The last item I want to mention is okay, so obviously these were some exploratory studies. Um, I hope um, moving forward, we can partner with people in science that they can uh, conduct studies that will inform us the way forward in a more scientific way, can help us test these interventions of design and architecture. But if we do that, if we have those partnerships, I think one benefit is that we can actually allocate costs and bring and understand the value of uh, good design decision making. These are some examples of the work we're doing. These are two publications in terms of we are analyzing the benefits of strategy design decision making on organizational outcomes, and if you do that, you can calculate the ROI and the effect of the bottom line. I um, changed the uh, end of my slides yesterday after uh, listening to the keynote class because to me it was a very powerful message that I heard and what I learned. And uh, it reminded me of a story. If my presentation is um, When I was an architecture student back in Iran, I would go sit in these old uh, ancient buildings and I would look and think why um, it was so comfortable, physically comfortable. But it was like a desert or a cold environment, but it was like very um, ter thermal comfort was excellent, everything was good, but also it was like soothing. Emotionally, it has something about it. And I would think, what is it? I couldn't quite uh, decode it, I couldn't quite put my finger on it as an architecture student with the things I learned. That was frustrating. Later, um, years after, I went to Texas a and and my first two years of work was focused on sustainable architecture. My job was to do energy simulation and lighting simulation. When I excelled using mathematical and uh, you know, simulation computing software like Energy Plus and DOE and Equest and so on, on uh, measuring impact of design, so optimizing envelope, shading, daylighting, uh, thermal mass, etc. And through that process of doing so much simulation, I learned something. And that was, okay, I learned about how to optimize an envelope, how to create shading devices, thermal mass, etc. Then looking back, I realized the architect thousand years ago, 700 years ago, actually had oriented the building well, had utilized the right shading devices, has uh, leaned on thermal mass, and many of the strategies I learned after two years of energy simulation. So my question is, did the architect 700 years ago have access to that simulation? I can't, I can't really connect the dots. They probably didn't. How did they go thousand years forward? And so I think when I listen, especially Elizabeth's presentation, that the powerful and the persuasive message she gave me 
Um, it was nothing that required for me for science to catch up and be able to prove it, you know. So um, what really helped me celebrate and understand the important the importance of core meaning of each of these distinct fields, architecture and psychology. And there is a value in that reflective, creative, experiential, inspirational uh, uh, approach to architecture that no one can deny. And that we have to follow because we need those creativity to push us forward a thousand years ahead until research science and approach and methods and simulations can catch up and show us the effect of that is on um, psychology, on health, and on performance. Therefore, for me, this was my learning of this conference, two distinct fields where they can learn a lot from each other and enhance their move forward. Um, thank you so much. Back into 
history in every different geographical location and really understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, but learning from the past people. Yeah. Probably because that is where a lot of the stars they have derived from and so the ability uh, to computationally figure that out to rely on methodology. Book on um, tropical architecture. Oh, yes. And I thought, mm -hmm. brilliant. Okay, they're going to talk about wind flow and lowering the temperature with air movement. But the particular book I was looking at was beautiful in tropical architecture. And they, they missed that opportunity to try and understand yes. the, the problems. Thank you, Eve.